Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, we're a webinar, we're a webcast, an online show. Uh, the terminology, as I say, is up for debate, whatever you want to call us. <laughs> um, what do you call these things? Um, but whatever you want us to call us, uh, we are here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, we, um, if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's okay. We do record the show every week as we are doing this morning and then they are posted onto our website. Uh, I will show you at the end of today's show where that is so you can get all of um, today's recording um, if you want to and any of our previous sessions that we have done. Um, the show and the uh, the live show and the recordings on our website are free and open to anyone to watch. So if you are um, thinking um, today's topic or one of our other topics is um, of interest to any of your friends, friends, family, or colleagues, do pass on our links and information to them. Anyone who wants to can um, join up with us and then watch our recordings afterwards. Um, we do a mixture of things here on this on uh, Encompass Live, book reviews, mini training sessions, interviews, demos of software, um, basically anything library related um, or, of, or could potentially be of interest to libraries, things libraries are doing, um, new, new products, resources, things they might be um, interested in. Uh, that's really our only criteria is that it somehow is of use to libraries uh, out there. Um, we do have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do do presentations here. and We do some more Nebraska-centric things and things that we're doing here out of the Library Commission. Um, but we do also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we've got today. On the line with us um, from just up the road <laughs> in Omaha is Amy Schindler, who is the... Um, uh, director of the Archives and Special Collections at the Chris Library at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, good morning, Amy. Good morning, Krista, and Hi. good morning, everyone. Um, and she's going to talk to us about a, I suppose, a work in progress still. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a new collection that they're, um, they've started up at um, UNO, the Queer Arma Omaha Archives. I heard about this on um, a colleague of mine, a librarian colleague, shared about it on Facebook that they were having their, um, you were having your um, dedication opening, you know, some, some events about it in the last couple of months. And um, it sounded like a really cool local thing that was being done. So I reached out to Amy and luckily she was available to join us and tell us a lot more about what's going on with this new archive. So I will just hand it over to you, Amy, to take it away and tell us about what you've been doing up there. Okay, thank you, um, Krista, for inviting me to do this Encompass Live presentation. Um, we're really excited to share more about Nebraska at Omaha's Queer Omaha Archives with everyone today. Um, as Krista said, the Queer Omaha Archives is a very new project for us, and we really appreciate uh, the Nebraska Library Commission's interest, as well as the interest and support of those of you who may be watching today or in our recorded future. So um, as I was thinking about, um, let me make sure my slides are working here. There we go. Um, as I was thinking about this presentation over the last few weeks, one of the notes I wrote to myself was, why are we here today? What does UNO's Chris Library have to share? And you know, the, the third thing I thought was, you know, what's so special about what we're doing? Um, part of the answer that I found for myself is, firstly, it's actually really nice to be able to share the sometimes important, sometimes exciting, and the often enjoyable work we're doing at our institutions with others. But as I was thinking further about why should I do this webinar when the Queer Omaha Archives is not necessarily something new in the United States? Um, I was reminded of other presentations I've attended or seen mentioned about new LGBTQ collections or collecting initiatives in recent years. There always seem to be a few people in the audience or in the comments on you know, blogs or other posts later who did not know that this was a thing. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm here today to add to the body of work about LGBTQ archives and collections and also to remind myself and my GLAM colleagues out there that there's always more work for us, outreach and otherwise, to do. Um, I don't think I'm surprising anyone with that statement. So uh, this work, of course, includes talking about our projects when we have access uh, to forum like this um, until everyone knows about our archives and our repositories. 
So today I'm going to talk about our collecting initiatives background, um, our partnerships involved in its creation and ongoing work, uh, the mostly good news about the recent launch of the Queer Omaha Archives, and then we'll also talk a bit about um, our plans for moving forward, sort of what is next. Um, so I'll begin with a few words just to situate myself in the Queer Omaha Archives. Um, I'm a cisgender, straight, white woman archivist who's leading this collecting initiative. Further, I'm a new resident of Omaha and Nebraska, having set foot here on the Great Plains for the first time less than three years ago. Uh, the Queer Omaha Archives joins a long list of similar collections in community, academic, historical societies, and other archives and special collections. Uh, LAGAR, the Lesbian and Gay Archives Roundtable of the Society of American Archivists, is oh about over 30 years old. Um, and its guide to repositories, Lavender Legacies, is about 20 years old. And just to interject here, my moment of feeling uh, long in the tooth as we say. Um, last week was remembering how helpful Lavender Legacies was um, back in the early days of the internet, and then also recalling my own contributions to it, updating entries in the early uh, days of this century. When you think back to the internet, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it, it sort of makes one pause a little bit. Um, my bigger point here, though, being just that the Queer Omaha Archives is joining many other established archives. And, um, you know, as, as we acknowledge, um, we are overdue for this initiative um, in Omaha and in Nebraska. So um, UNO's LGBTQ material in the archives prior to 2015 was not voluminous. Um, we have some material in the congressional papers of Chuck Hagel, but that collection uh, was closed. And much of what was in the university archives was the usual type of material you would expect to find in a university archives, including things like um, eight and a half by 11 flyers, like this one that were posted around campus. Um, articles in the student newspapers, as well as um, some somewhat brief mentions in faculty senate and task force records. Um, and as a side note, we, we might have some personal papers of LGBT folks here in the archives, um, but they were not identified as such at the time that those collections were initially accessioned. So that's a project to sort of go back and re-examine some of our collections um, to see what, you know, what else may be in there as far as content and to do some re, um, um, to do some additional description of those collections. So in 2014, uh, Chris Library Archives and Special Collections revised its entire collecting statement um, for the first time since, um, well, since the Reagan administration. So the new portion of our collecting statement that relates to the Queer Omaha Archives um, is on your screen here. Uh, it reads, material in special collections includes unique and specialized items of local, state, and regional interest with a particular focus on Omaha history and culture. And then emphasis added here, areas of focus are individuals and organizations which have traditionally been underdocumented. Um, we intentionally left this um, broad um, we knew that there was a lot of work uh, to be done uh, in the Omaha community that could be done. Um, we spent some time, uh, myself and a co uh, my colleague Bob Nash spent some time in 2014. Uh, we called it, uh, we went on archives field trips <laughs> and visited with some of our um, other colleagues uh, here in the area at other cultural heritage institutions, learning about what they were collecting, sort of floating the ideas of things we were thinking about adding to our collecting statement and getting a little feedback um, from our colleagues. Um, here at UNO, though, for a number of years um, prior to 20, 2013, really, um, the archives faced um, a, a pretty sad circumstance that, unfortunately, many archives and special collections had faced. We didn't have enough staff, our space was insufficient, and we didn't have enough resources. Um, actively collecting archival and manuscript collections was not always encouraged, supported, or frankly even possible. Uh, the good news for us is that between 2013 and 2015, the department doubled from four people to eight people. Um, our workspace was also significantly expanded and beautifully renovated. And relatedly, we also then had an increased emphasis on collecting new material for the archives and providing access. 
So what really, really got the Queer Omaha Archives off the ground um, came about uh, last year. In October 2015, during um, LGBTQ History Month, Josh Burford of UNC Charlotte was invited to campus by my wonderful UNO colleague, Jesse Hitchens. Jesse is the director of the Gender and Sexuality Resource Center here at UNO, um, it's part of UNO Student Affairs Unit. Uh, Josh Burford gave two talks about queer history and then another about queer archival and, uh, and historical qualitative inquiry. Uh, his visit, as you can see, was co-sponsored by Sociology and Anthropology Department, uh, the GSRC, and the Gender and Sexual Orientation Student Agency. As I said, the Queer Omaha Archives was created uh, pretty directly because of this event. Um, in the days before Burford visited cam uh, campus, he reached out to me inquiring if the archives here had an interest in creating an LGBTQ collection, to which our answer was yes, of course. We, we hadn't gotten to that yet, but we are very interested in it. And, and then followed up with a thank you very much for getting all these campus folks uh, thinking about the possibility and talking about it and getting the folks uh, with potential interest, you know, together in a room. So after uh, that, those two talks in November 2015, uh, my campus colleague, Jesse Hitchens, put out a call to her extensive uh, Rolodex of campus and community contacts, uh, contacts for a meeting here in Chris Library to discuss creating an LGBTQ collection at UNO. Uh, the folks invited included representatives from various community organizations, representative student organizations, uh, some queer faculty members, including those who were teaching courses that were part of a new LGBTQ and sexuality studies minor here at UNO that's directed by Professor Jay Irwin. And then, of course, Chris Library's Archives and Special Collections was at that meeting. Um, attendees brainstormed potential collections and folks to contact for this new archives we were talking about. Um, to start the meeting off, I provided some basic information about what an archives would and would not collect, how the donation process works, including the ever exciting donor agreements, um, and also talked about potential financial contributions to support the ongoing work of the collection. We discussed how researchers might use the material because some people you know, who aren't familiar with the work we do in archives, libraries, museums, of course, might ask, well, what's the point of collecting all this? What's, what's, what are you going to do with it? Um, and then, of course, we also talked with folks about what we would do to care for the collection long term. Um, and, you know, there, there's a bit of that work of reassuring folks that this isn't a passing fancy. It's not something we're just going to do for a year or five years, and then it will go away, or it will go away when um, a particular myself or someone else leaves the university, that there's a long-term commitment to care for this collection. Um, we always want to reassure, uh, reassure folks about that. Um, we also explain to folks there that there are some things we would not want to add to the collection. And this might be for reasons of space, preservation needs, or that the material on offer was outside of our usual scope. For example, things like t-shirts. <laughs> Um, we're very fortunate, obviously, um, in 2016 to have the option to fairly easily photograph um, objects that we do not want to add physically to our collections. So we would then retain the photos of those items in our collection. And an example of t-shirts, um, we might even eventually submit the photos that we've added to our collection to a site like, um, like this, uh, like wearinggayhistory.com, um, which you know, is a wonderful site and you should go browse it if you haven't already. So also at our organizing meeting, we discussed the potential geographic scope of the collection. For those of you who are joining us from outside of Nebraska, I know there's a couple of you out there. Um, uh, you're probably like most of us who maybe haven't lived in the Midwest and not quite aware of, of where things are situated, but Omaha is located in the easternmost part of Nebraska. <clears throat> Driving across the state is a drive of around six hours. And we're very much a Midwestern city, as well as being part of the Great Plains. But I also think of us as being pretty close to my notion of the American West. Omaha is situated immediately across the Missouri River uh, from Council Bluffs, Iowa. And about one half of the state's population lives here in the Omaha metro area. At our initial organizing meeting back in November, we ultimately decided that the collection would 
collect material from the Omaha metro area, loosely defined, that metro area. Um, but we would also be open to collecting from uh, material from across the state of Nebraska in the future. Um, if another cultural heritage organization, um, you know, in Lincoln or another community in the state did not have a particular interest or tie to collecting um, that material that, you know, might have been offered to us. Um, so that metro area material does include, you know, very western Iowa. Council Bluff since it's part of our metro area. Um, our attendees at, at our initial organizing meeting were also very interested in the potential oral history project. Many people, of course, are when they hear about it. Um, we discussed uh, possibilities for folks who could be interviewed and how we might go about collecting those interviews. Um, and this is something that um, I have experience with from work at um, a previous institution. Um, we talked about how the oral history program could be a funded project. We could raise money to hire someone to do the oral history interviews. Um, but we also talked about other options, such as working with a small group of um, interested and trained individuals from the community or a specific organization, um, or working with um, a UNO class, a uh, faculty member and students who were going to, who might collect um, inter oral history interviews as part of their cor coursework. We also had some further discussion of potential projects with UNO faculty um, related to their courses um, as far as both the students going out and seeking material um, and letting us back in the archives know about material they'd come across. Um, uh, maybe in, especially in private hands during the course of their own research. But then we also um, indicated that we would, we could be interested, depending on what it was, of course, be interested in adding material created by our students as part of their coursework that could then come to the archives. Um, our group also discussed long-term goals related to fundraising. And this, um, it really, uh, it warmed my heart um, how much folks uh, in attendance um, understood the need to have, um, to raise money to support this initiative, um, you know, both in the short and long term. Um, we discussed things like potentially establishing an endowment and the potential, um, um, the possibility for renaming the collection to honor community member or community members in the future. And sort of almost finally, we knew um, when we were together that day that we wanted to hold a very public event to announce the collection of the public, to welcome the public um, not only into the archives and into the library, but onto campus. Um, we are a metropolitan university here at, Yale, here at UNO, and that community engagement and having um, members of the community come to our campus as well as those on campus go off campus, work with the community, is very important. We initially thought that we would hold our community launch um, just a couple of months later in February. It was very ambitious of us. <laughs> um, the final piece of business we discussed at that initial organizing meeting was what we were going to call this initiative. Um, we'd been referring to it more, um, you know, as it was a sort of a sentence like the name. It really wasn't a name proper. So um, after some discussion, um, the name Queer Omaha Archives was selected by, by those in attendance. Okay. Um, in the weeks that followed our initial meeting with committee members and students and faculty members, Jesse Hitchens from the Gender and Sexuality Resource Center and I uh, had a bit of a reality check with each other. We both acknowledged that we had a lot going on in those winter months, um, so we decided that we would delay our plans by a few months um, and hold our public reception announcing the collection in this summer. This time was important to the archives um, and it's, I think, it's eventual um, successful launch for a number of reasons. First, we decided to hold our launch event in the summer, so we didn't have to worry about winter weather. But more importantly, after the um, doing it in the summer allowed us to have it after our annual Heartland Pride Festival, and this, of course, would then allow us to do some outreach um, at, at Pride and related to Pride. Secondly, delaying that public launch gave me time in the archives 
to work with a very enthusiastic student to build the LGBTQ records in the university archives. Um, we probably had, I would say, less than 50 identified pages, um, and that was mostly flyers um, when we were getting this started. And working with that student, we've built that up to several cubic foot of records that now include publications, even more flyers, administrative records of student organizations, some memorabilia, and signs from protests and rallies like the one you see here. Um, the students' passion and interest for the archives was frequently demonstrated as they made numerous trips from the student union to the library, bringing boxes of records from multiple student organizations and offering us very pieces, various pieces of memorabilia. I just want to note here that we accepted some of the memorabilia and other material that our student offered, but we also declined some of what was offered. Um, so that's just a reminder for all of us that appraisal is important. Um, even in the early stages of building a collecting initiative when you, you may be somewhat fearful, you know, you don't want to discourage people by saying no, but there are some things we should not accept um, and we need to be um, forthright with our potential donors um, and educate them about what we may and may not want. So. Um, and before I leave this slide, I'll just share sort of my fun archives fact about this sign. Um, at the bottom of the sign there, it's sort of dark in this particular uh, version of the scan, but that's glitter. <laughs> and this particular sign, um, after we received it over the winter, led to the creation of my favorite note on an archival container to date. And it always makes me giggle when I open that particular uh, map case drawer. The folder reads, warning, contains glitter. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably not something you see in most library collections, that kind of warning. <laughs> not usually. And, um, <laughs> You know, at some point we may mm -hmm. decide to encapsulate it, but uh, or, or something. But I it's, say, yeah, it could be like laminated or something to make it no, less no, like not, less falling off. <laughs> no, no, Krista, we never laminate. No. Oh, okay, sorry. That's that's, that's <laughs> an evil word. We mm -hmm. encapsulate. Encapsulate. We okay. In uh, plastic mylar sleeves. So, mm, there you um, go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and we've we've since received um, a couple other. Uh, these are signs, posters from, you know, rallies and protests and things. So we've received a few others that have glitter as well. But this is mm. this was probably the first one, and it's really probably my favorite. So <laughs> have to share that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that sidebar. Um, <laughs> So, um, during this past spring semester, we also had an opportunity um, to continue solidifying some of the libraries and archives partnerships on campus with the UNO Gender and Sexuality Resources, uh, Resources Center, but also with English professor uh, Tammy Kennedy. The library was a co-sponsor for a series of events uh, last April that we dubbed the Sexuality Extravaganza, which included a screening of the wonderful documentary TIG with director Christina Goolsby, and that was co-sponsored by Film Streams. And then we also had appearances by author Anna Pulley and artist Kelsey Beyer for their wonderful book, The Lesbian Haiku Book with Cats, exclamation point. Um, this partnership created an opportunity for the library to be included in these events. Some of them were held at the library, um, but when you co-sponsor an event, your name always gets mentioned, you know, on the publicity. But then at the actual, um, the book reading, the film screening, not only was the library mentioned as a co-sponsor, but we also then would have um, an opportunity for this mention of, so hey, we're starting this new initiative called the Queer Omaha Archives here at UNO. Um, and so that was a way to get that um, in front of some of our students uh, and UNO employees. So that was great. Um, another prof uh, partnership with English professor Tammy Kennedy was the ingestion of her students' work into the Queer Omaha Archives. Professor Kennedy offered her queer film course for the first time during the spring semester. She had decided to require her students to do their responses to films and some other writing on individual blogs that were created for the course. And early in the semester, she extended the invitation to her students to add their blogs to the Queer Omaha archives, after talking with us, of course. <laughs> um, and according to Professor Kennedy, uh, when she offered this to the students, they were all excited by the offer and she said it seemed to make them a bit more thoughtful um, about the work that they were producing. 
And this is just a photo of Professor Kennedy, uh, her students, and um, some of their guests at a film screening. Uh, in this upcoming fall semester, we're going to work with Professor Kennedy and another faculty member um, on two different courses they're doing. And their students are going to have an oral history component. And the intention there is that those oral histories that they're collecting with Omaha community members um, will be added to the uh, Queer Omaha archives. So uh, let me move on to the public launch of the collection. We signed up to share a table with our friends from the Gender and Sexuality Resources Center at Heartland Pride, Heartland Pride Festival um, in, in this past June. Um, this is our ad that appeared um, in the Pride program. We paid a little, you know, a little extra for that. And then we also distributed this on postcard sized flyers at Pride. And on the reverse side um, was a brief you know, blurb about what the archives was with a link to our contact info and our website. Um, and then, as, as Krista mentioned, how she heard about um, this whole thing, it was also shared, um, shared widely in the community um, on Facebook and other platforms. Um, and, you know, thanks mm -hmm. to Facebook, it really, um, you know, Krista, you're, you're living, you're proof of it, but <laughs> I heard from a lot of other folks, too, um, at Pride and then also at our public launch, you know, sort of chatting them up, so how did you hear about this? You know, did you hear about it from so-and-so or so-and-so? And, you know, you know, I just, I saw it on Facebook. So, um, you know, as much as I bemoan Facebook some days, it, it, it's, it's helpful. It has, it, it, there are definitely <laughs> has its uses, yes, absolutely. And I think I actually saw someone link to some this flyer somewhere, like online or something, because yeah. I, I do recognize yeah. it, yeah, from the, from what I was looking at on Facebook, yeah. And I mean, that that's something I talk about is sort of how much I think about when I had my first like academic archive job, archives job, you know, 15 years ago. And I remember going out and prospecting for collections at the time. And it was, I was sending paper letters because, you know, if they had a website, it often didn't have even an email on it. Mm -hmm. I, just, I had to call people on the phone. So, you know, we still do that now, but it, it certainly, it took a lot more effort you know, to, to get that reach that we're able to get much quicker now. That's yeah. You have to use all of the, all the resources you have in, at hand. Yeah. Any, Absolutely. any type of promotional area you can get into. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, and, and a further result of that sharing on Facebook um, was about a week before Heartland Pride, I was contacted by Terry Sweeney. Uh, Mr. Sweeney had lots of questions for me about this new collecting initiative he'd heard about on Facebook. Um, he was asking questions that, frankly, I do not typically receive from, you know, a prospective donor during our first chat. Um, he was asking about our, what was our funding model going to be? What was our long-term sustainability plan? Um, he would even quiz me about the particulars of our collecting policy that he had browsed our website and found. Um, someone was reading our collecting policy. It was, it was quite impressive. Um, but during that conversation, it was a long conversation. Um, he very quickly decided that he wished to donate his collection to us in honor of his deceased life partner, Pat Phelan. Uh, the Terry Sweeney and Pat Phelan papers include local magazines that they had a role in publishing called The New Voice. Um, also programs that you see here, lots of photos, several scrapbooks, a good bit of memorabilia, and more material. Terry is a fairly organized person, I would say. Um, as you can see on the right there, I'm, I'm, I think you can read it, on those Ziploc bags, which you might chuckle at, but he's labeled the Ziploc bags as to their contents. Um, so we know that you know, those two banners, which marches they were from, um, they, happened, they were carried by the Nebraska delegations um, at the marches on Washington in the 80s and early 90s. And one of them was actually signed by the folks from Nebraska who attended the 1987 March on Washington. So the collection include lots, lot, includes lots of interesting documents and photographs, as well as some of that memorabilia. And frankly, because of the perfect timing of Terry's gift, you know, I, these photos you see here, these were sort of the quick photos I took with my camera, you know, a uh, day or two before Pride, um, as well as a few others, and, um, you know, put them on an iPad, and was able to um, show those to folks that we were talking with at Pride um, when we were talking about these are the types of things that we already have in the Queer Omaha Archives and that we want more of. 
So um, here is a picture of our table at Heartland Pride Festival. And the little close up there at the top is you have to have giveaways. People love the giveaways. Uh, so we had a whole bunch of things, um, including the UNO beach balls, which um, children of all ages enjoy beach balls. I can tell you that. Um, but we also had some temporary tattoos. So, excuse me, temporary tattoos and some buttons. The library recently got a button maker and people have been very enthusiastic about using our button maker. We were also uh, fortunate that our wonderful student supporter um, also promoted the Queer Omaha, Omaha Archives for us at a separate Pride event the evening before that was specifically for teens and young people. On that very warm <laughs> Nebraska Saturday, uh, we talked to over 400 people at our table um, during the just under six hours that we were able to keep ourselves hydrated. Um, and this included, you know, members of the general public who were walking by, stopped by to get a pen or a button or what have you, um, and we chatted them up. But it also included folks from um, other community organizations. And some of the folks who I had been emailing with in the, you know, weeks leading up to Pride about potential um, donations to the archives did stop by the table. I told them we would be there and that I hope they would stop by and several of them actually did stop by the table and we were able to um, you know have brief conversations but it was also just important that they could see me and meet me and realize I was a real person uh, and not just somebody behind an email address. And I think of benefit for the university is that um, we also ended up talking with a number of students who were going to be coming to UNO. So they were you know, incoming freshmen or transfer students or graduate students who were at Pride. Some of them were there with their parents. Um, and that was a nice opportunity to talk about uh, the university as an inclusive environment. Um, and I think that made some of the parents who we were seeing that day, uh, uh, freshmen, feel a little bit uh, better about their, their little ones leaving the nest. Uh, so we invited everyone to visit our website, to come to the opening on July 13th. We had cards that we were handling out, our cards with more information, the invitation that we were handing out that day. So the actual launch, um, about a month before our opening reception, Jesse Hitchens and I uh, met with a colleague from our university communications office. And we were actually thrilled because they had contacted us about a press release for the Queer Omaha archives and potential media placements. So that announcement went out the week before the event. Um, the announcement that was written by the university was picked up and published in a few local papers as those press releases often are. And then Jesse and I spoke with a reporter from the Omaha World Herald, which is our major newspaper here, um, and she wrote an article for the newspaper. Um, I was also interviewed by a local radio station before the actual uh, our before actual reception, and then a local TV station came to the reception and filmed some, filmed some B-roll footage, and they included mention of our reception in sort of one of those around the metro, you know, 30-second news highlight clips that you um, see on the local news. So we were, we were happy with the media coverage that the Queer Omaha Archives opening received. Um, I was, however, once again reminded that the online comment section of newspaper articles, apparently especially on Facebook, in the case of the Omaha World Herald newspaper, are often not what I would call an affirming and happy place to visit. So in the interest of self-care, just a reminder to everyone, it can be important to schedule something joyful or cleansing to do after reading those comments. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's um, a good, uh, some people use the, use the phrase, you know, just never read the comments. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you, it is, I think it's important, you'll see in all sorts of topics that some things it'll be agreeable and some not. It's better to be aware Absolutely. of what's going on out there. But then, yeah, I, I like your idea, just, you know, Afterwards, do something good for yourself. <laughs> yeah, I sort of very intentionally waited till Saturday afternoon, read the comments, and then I went to the Jocelyn Art Museum Thank and you. saw an, an, an exhibit I've been waiting to see. Um, and I haven't gone back to revisit the comments since, but, you know, I don't want to – there was – there were actually some people in there, you know, trying to have a discussion, um, but there were some folks who were, you know, less um, – less inclusive than I wish they would be. Mm -hmm. But I will say that um, I want to like, make sure that everyone knows uh, that we are going to include copies of all of those comments in the Queer Omaha archives in our mm -hmm. ephemera collection. 
So we want to make sure that we document the public re public's reception of the collection, and that'll include the happy photos from our reception, as well as those comments that people made on a news article. It's all part of history, yes. It is, mm -hmm. and and we do get to choose what we put in the archives. So we're you know we're choosing to put that in there. Um, one thing reporters, I've been I was asked um, by a reporter for for this opening, and I've been asked it about other collections at other repositories I've worked at, is what are people's reaction mm -hmm. to to this new collection. And and then the sort of their follow-up question is, you know, is your boss okay with it? Is the president, you know, of the university or the chancellor, have they said anything to you? And and usually at that point, you know, it hasn't maybe gone public, and so there hasn't been much of a reaction. And so it's not until that newspaper article comes out that you sort of hear that any negative reaction. But it it happens, so be prepared for that. Um, so uh, th this, I just want to mention here, kind of a little quick sidebar, um, the button here is about Amendment 16, uh, 416. Um, this anti-Amendment 416 button was actually offered to the Queer Omaha Archives the day before opening reception, maybe two days by my uh, wonderful library colleague, Angela Krager. And it was actually a great item to have in the collection. And I was like, oh no, we are displaying this at the reception. <laughs> there's, there's no ifs, ands, or about it. Um, and actually, um, more than one person, when I was chatting with them at the reception or afterwards, said, you know, I've got some things about 416 I've been holding on to. And it wasn't a lot of material, but they had something they had held on to. And do you think you might want that for the archives? And we were like, yes, of course, please offer us that material. We would love to have it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, that's the idea, yeah. And I should say, Angela is who I saw this mm -hmm. saw about the archives on on Facebook from. She's the one who shared about the opening and um, got me, you know, uh, connected with you. <laughs> got us, got us, got us together. Angela <laughs> yes. is one of my colleagues here in our archives and special collections. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a cataloger. Yep. So uh, back to the party. Mm -hmm. um, so we held the opening reception for the Queer Omaha Archives about. Uh, actually two weeks ago, on July 13th, we were absolutely thrilled to welcome over 80 guests to Chris Library Archives and Special Collections that evening. Um, our, our target audience for the event was the general public, but it was also open to you and employees and students. And we ended up with guests um, split pretty closely between those those cat, um, those you know populations of members of the public, UNO students, and UNO employees. And while a number of our wonderful library colleagues came to show their support, we also welcomed folks from across campus, most of whom had never visited Archives and Special Collections, so that was wonderful for us. Um, the Archives and Special Collections uh, staff and students, I have to say, did amazing work that leading up to it to make it a success and provide all of our guests with a great experience. Uh, you can see in the top two photos there, we have a display of items from the Queer Omaha Archives that we staged in our workroom. And our workroom is where we do all of our arrangement description of collections. And then we also had a brief program uh, that included Jesse Hitchens there on the lower left and the Dean of the UNO Libraries, Dave Richards. They talked about our goals and dreams for the collection, including future potential donations, this you know, potential oral history program, paid student internships, um, possible paid student internships, hoped for student internships, um, hoped for fund fundraising, and more. Uh, and so it usually happens to archivists when you get into conversation. That evening, we heard about many basements, garages, and storage units that needed to be visited. Uh, we also heard about personal stories uh, from folks that needed to be recorded. They didn't have any records, but they have they have a story to share. And when also, as we were talking with maybe the younger professionals who joined us that evening, the younger folks, the non-students, <laughs> younger folk, uh, and, and then some newer members of the Omaha community as well, um, we were talking with them about potential outreach um, and other kinds of events that we could hold, you know, with the, archi the Queer Omaha Archives or that we could hold in the library's archives, um, you know, hosting, you know, they do like a monthly happy hour and we could host that in the archives and have a display of material just for, um, uh, there's a local group here in Omaha called Rebel. Um, it's a, kind of a, a, a younger lesbian.
and a half hours of the receptions. It was past time for my uh, wonderful colleagues from archives who'd been there from the beginning of the reception to go home. And then a bit later, as I said to a few enthusiastic guests a little later, as the library was closing, um, we would maybe host future events in the library during the academic year when the library is open until midnight. That night we were only open until nine. So uh, what's next for the Queer Omaha Archives? We have a number of community members and organizations that we're following up with about donating collections. I've heard from multiple community members who'd like to volunteer with us on organizing collections. And we've decided we're gonna have one volunteer start in August, and then we're gonna wait a few months um, when we have some more collections and have things a bit more um, ready um, to bring in further volunteers in the community. We are going to be talking with an organization next month about a, pot a potential fundraising initiative. We want to capitalize on the success of our opening reception and ensure that we maintain contact with attendees. Conveniently, our library here at UNO recently welcomed a new communications specialist to our staff. Um, she actually joined us the week before the reception. So we're going to be talking uh, with her about how best to maintain a flow of information to folks um, who are interested in the Queer Omaha archives. Uh, we're also talking with an arts organization about potential joint prog programming in the months ahead. And this is someone the library has never previously worked with, so that's pretty exciting for us. And we'd also like to hear from local and regional cultural heritage organizations who may have an interest in working together on this or related initiatives. Uh, we set up the Queer Omaha Archives site, um, this site on Omeka, just to show folks how we can display digital objects that are part of the collection as well as to serve as a home for information about the Queer Omaha Archives. Uh, you can see that includes information about how to make donations. There's a link there to the university's foundation so people can get dropped in and make a gift directly to the Queer Omaha Archives Fund. Um, we set up the Omeka site also in part because this past spring the library was going through a website redesign and we were moving from one, you know, one platform to a new CMS. Pages were changing. We weren't going to be able to sort of update things in the weeks leading up to um, the public launch this summer in Pride. So the Omeka site allowed us to promote, you know, we're going to be at Pride on Saturday. See us there and, you know, save the dates and have that information out there for folks. Uh, our Omeka site um, also links to finding aids that we have for collections that are part of the Queer Omaha Archives. We, you can see here we use archive space for our collection management system. And just a cataloging note, as my colleague um, Angela and I were working on accessioning these first collections uh, for the Queer Omaha Archives, she raised the matter of how should we identify those collections in their finding aids. And at her suggestion, we went with, you can see there at the bottom, a local subject heading. Uh, that just says Queer Omaha Archives. And um, everything donated after November 2015 that was given with some intention by the donor for the Queer Omaha Archives will receive this subject heading. And then what we're doing uh, to connect any collections we received prior to the official launch of the Queer Omaha Archives is uh, we have, we use LibGuides for our research guides. Um, and we you can see we have a whole bunch of different subject guides uh, for things from archives and special collections. So we'll use this um, for material related to LGBTQIA history um, um, on LibGuides. So um, thank you again, everybody. Uh, the Queer Omaha Archives at UNO uh, Chris Library Archives and Special Collections, as we said, was established to collect, provide access to, and preserve the history of LGBTQ life in the region. Um, we have a long way to go in the work ahead of us. But the enthusiastic response, mostly enthusiastic response to this collecting initiative from partner organizations, members of the public, students and others has, in my, I will acknowledge, biased opinion, been wonderful for the archives, but also um, pretty darn good for the library and the university as well. Um, I think it's opening the eyes of many folks on and off campus, the potential of partnerships uh, between the archives, the library, uh, and, and community organizations, as well as just generating some goodwill. Um, one of the first bits of feedback we actually received from outside of our, right, our initial bubble of supporters um, was from the parent of a new graduate, actually. Uh, the parent heard about the Queer Omaha Archives um, at the university's Lavender graduation this past spring, uh, and they told the university's chancellor, you know, um, boss, <laughs> the boss boss, that um, that they thought this was a great thing, the Queer Omaha Archives. So yay archives, um, and thank you to those parents. 
So thank you again for your interest uh, in listening to me this morning, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Okay, thanks, Amy. Um, that's that was great. Exactly what I was looking for to find out what was going on. I like I, I had said at the beginning. I know this is a uh, work in progress, work in something progress. brand new. Yeah. Just <laughs> so, getting started. Well, yes, but um, I was glad to hear about it and get to see you know get the word out about what you are doing there. Um, if anyone does have any questions, type them into your question section um, of the GoToWebinar interface, and I will grab them and pass them on to Amy. And we do have some that did come in while you were talking. Um, I did. I did, I have a note to myself that I'd say when I saw what. Um, Terry had done with vagging and labeling all those things. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, yeah. that must be like a librarian at heart or something. <laughs> How it was so organized and, and he, yeah. He's a collector. Yeah. He's a, you know, he's a personality. He is a saver yeah. and a collector. <laughs> and, um, but he's also a donor who he's going to start volunteering with us next month on organizing nice. mm -hmm. his, his, his collection. Um, but he was mm -hmm. also very generous with his time when he brought in the first two um, accessions of material and wanted to sit down. He didn't just want to leave it and drop it off the boxes and go. Mm -hmm. He wanted to sit down and we walked through um, a lot of the material he donated. Um, but there's a lot more for him to do as far as identifying people and events and things, especially in photographs. <laughs> oh, sure, yeah, that's what you need yeah. somebody to do, unless something's very yeah. easy, you know, been written yeah. on or something been included with it. Yeah, that's what you usually end up with in a lot of these cases is, yeah. Yeah. I don't know who these people are. Yeah. <laughs> or no, what he remembers some of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, a few questions we have come in. Um, what's, um, can you give an example of something that you didn't accept as a donation, something that did not meet the sure. criteria you guys have set? Mm -hmm. Well, um, a number of things that Terry offered, actually, um, and he's loaned them to us, and we're going to return them to him. So um, the, the the big one that comes to mind is um, plaques and awards, um, and these are from various organizations, um, employers, community organizations, mm -hmm. um, you know, Icon, a local group here in, in Nebraska, um, Eagle, which was an employee group of what was um, U.S. West. Um, so things like that. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think what else Terry. I mean, we we accepted a lot of Terry's memorabilia, frankly, because it was in great. It's in great condition, um, and he had some really interesting pieces. Like you can see in the photograph here, kind of uh, at the front of the photo there, in, in the middle of the table. That's a brick <laughs> that's been decorated with some, not glitter, but some detailing, glitter-like detailing. But it's actually a brick from the Diamond Bar, which was here in Omaha, and it was known as Omaha or Nebraska's oldest gay bar. Oh. Now there's there's some there's some some things we're hearing about. There was a gay bar that was actually in Omaha in the 40s that we want to follow up on. But the point is that the Diamond Bar was known as the oldest gay bar in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. So that was something that was give the brick, the decorated brick, was given to Pat Phelan, Terry's partner, by the owner of the Diamond Bar. Mm -hmm. um, I think when it was either moving or when it closed. Mm -hmm. So. Nice. Yeah. Um, that's just something to be at when the question about something you didn't accept that this is something that's not even just specific to your collection, but libraries in general, having your collection policies so people know yeah. what is and isn't accepted. Um, we have the same thing here at the commission. We have our um, Nebraska Memories Project. There are certain things we can take and it just has the criteria that what is and isn't, you know what we're looking for. And that can also be adjusted in the future if you just suddenly discover, wait, right. this is actually something that we didn't realize was important. Let's, you know, it's not in stone. <laughs> um, right. And policies, if, if somebody yeah. out there would like to um, give us a financial gift to create an endowment yeah, uh, so to, hire, to hire someone and to buy the supplies and this, the storage space to care for some of that, you know, like T-shirts mm -hmm. um, and other kind of like drag costumes. They take a lot of space and resources to care for. And special, um, special, special, like, um, rooms, climate and whatnot to just preserve them properly. Right. So, well, we yeah. have the climate controlled storage room. It's just sort mm -hmm. of the space in that room yeah. um, and the boxes or the mannequins mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that the T-shirts, that's something that we're not planning to accept, but we definitely plan to photograph mm -hmm. them. And right, we'll and document them that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any plans to digitize anything? Yeah. And to make um, it available in that way to people who can't come to Omaha to... 
Yeah. So um, on our Omeka site there, which again we set up as a quick demonstration site, you can see on the right hand side there there's two buttons and those are again those are two buttons from Terry's collection and again we photograph those you know with my phone very quickly so I could take them to Pride Festival and show them to people and then also went ahead and just put that photo into a Mecca um, but there yes we've had conversations with some people who they maybe don't want to donate the original to us but mm -hmm. they're willing to let us digitize it or is born digital of course and so that content um, we'll put into this Omeka site. That's something that you could do you have like the scanning um, equipment for that um, or is that something you'd also need donations for we like do, the scan yeah. documents and whatnot? Yeah, no, we're we're fortunate. We have a couple of very nice flatbed scanners. We have a cool. a nice okay. book eye overhead scanner. We have um, the library oh. has cameras, and so we have like the black backdrop where we can set up a little photo studio to shoot mm -hmm. artifacts nicely. So That's, they won't yeah. you won't be able to see the the laminate table in the background when we, <laughs> we shoot these pins. And yeah. Buttons, so. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you're the the special collections to begin with. You've got your resources there, and this is a subset of that. So. Right. Nice. Um, I was actually really when I saw that Angela had shared this, I was like, oh, this is this is great. Cause I know we have, you know, there's the um, uh, bars here in, in Lincoln and Omaha for this. And that we, we have the population, the group here. Mm -hmm. um, and I was yeah. actually I can't I think I was a little surprised that it wasn't already something yeah. I think I know you said some people didn't even know it was a thing I was like really right. we have such a we have parades and the events and stuff I just I we have hasn't done it yet. Yeah. yeah I was actually surprised myself do you know is and you this is you know, Omaha and you said it's for the region which is kind of a nice greater Omaha region nice um to make it a little vague I guess so you can expand as you need do you know if UNL yes. here in Lincoln is thinking of doing something or has something similar or are you guys working together or so when we when we had that initial organizing meeting last winter, um, you know, folks were some of the, some of the folks in the room uh, were very. Well, this should be a Nebraska wide collection, and so I could actually have that conversation with them about well, you know, we don't want if someone else is collecting this in Lincoln or in Grand Island or somewhere else, we don't want to step on their toes. You know, we we like to respect each other's you know our repositories and work together and collaborate. So I said, you know, let me reach out to my colleague Mary Ellen Ducey at UNL and see what they're doing, if they have any plans, if they'd like to, um, and so I you know emailed Mary Ellen and, and said, are you, you know, we're planning to do this. You mm -hmm. know, are you, are you doing something similar? Because if you are, we'll stay out of Lincoln and mm -hmm. then we won't, we won't, we won't collect anything. We'll refer everyone to you. Um, so we, we had that contact and um, UNL is focusing on collecting from UNL organizations and groups. Um, mm -hmm. And I did some kind of quick web surfing. I didn't contact every repository in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. So if anyone out there is collecting from Nebraska, I would I'd love to, to chat with you. And yeah. I think we could work together. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't have to be um, you're separate because you're in different locations. There, there could be something you guys should be referring people to each other. You know, if someone's in exactly. Lincoln and or is, you know, in Omaha, but only heard about Lincoln's, what Lincoln's doing, mm -hmm. Lincoln should be saying, oh, it's okay. You've got, there's, go up there. You know, that's where you're actually, that's where you live. Check out their set. Or if there's something out west or something, um, you guys should be able to, you know, send people between them and all or have links to their websites or or, or, or databases or digitized collections or whatever. And frankly, I mean, yeah. we're always looking to partner with people here at UNO. So if if somebody somewhere else is another repository, another cultural heritage organization in Nebraska or even in Council Bluffs, Iowa, does want to start their own collection, uh, let's talk. And I'd be very happy. We could create a site that is, you know, we come up with a different name that's sort of like the Nebraska mm -hmm. Queer Archives or something like that. Like, so. like the Nebraska Consor Queer Consortium, and then here's all those individual <laughs> archives that are part of it in their different various areas. And we're planning maybe this right be, now. <laughs> yeah, maybe to be a little more aggressive, it, it would be maybe the Great Plains or something like that. Oh exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. I and I, I should say too, there are people who are doing this in other parts of the country. So like Josh oh, yeah. Burford at UNC, he started an initiative called 
um, queering the South. Hmm. And so hmm. he's trying to get, you know, representatives from all the Southern states to kind of work together or share their, their info. I'm not sure how that's going, but I know he was hoping to do that. Hmm. So if anybody wants to queer the Great Plains, let's talk. <laughs> let's do it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I know my, our colleagues, you know, at the University of Wyoming, they, they did amazing work after the um, – uh, horrible, horrible uh, murder of Matthew Shepard, you know, mm -hmm. in documenting, um, you know, the the online and social media response to, to his murder. So mm -hmm. people are doing this and um, we can, why not work together? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, being you being so new, as you said, to the Great Plains and not native to here, which I am not, I am as well. Um, I've been uh -huh. here longer than you, about 15 years yeah. now. Um, <laughs> I can't believe it, but it's been that long. <laughs> um, I'm originally uh, from, huh? I said you blink and it's <laughs> yeah. 15 years. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm, yet, like, I'm considered a native or not. I don't know how long that takes, but <laughs> um, I'm originally from New York. Uh -huh. um, you've done a great job of uh, grasping what's going on out here and getting this um, uh, collection and archives going, and I think it's awesome. Thank you. Very, thank you for, yeah, for joining us. that it's being day. done, yeah. Anybody have any, we're almost to the top of the hour again, so I just wanted to put it out there. Anybody have any last-minute urgent questions for Amy about what she's doing or any ideas or thoughts about other collections or things you know about? Let's get them into the question section there. Um, while you're working on that, I'll tell you, we, we are recording, so um, this will be up on our YouTube, as we mentioned earlier, and then Amy, yep, I'll send it to you. You can link to it, grab the YouTube um, video for whatever use you want to um, put it in the collection and all. Um, I have also grabbed uh, all the various websites and locations you've mentioned that I could find online and put into our <laughs> Delicious account, and um, Library Commission uses Delicious to um, uh, uh, collect uh, links to various things just makes it easy to get it onto um, our recording page afterwards. So some of the different groups, the Gender and Sexuality Resource Center, um, LIGAR from the Society of American Archivists, your website. So we've got a lot of these things linked in there. Um, that'll be available to everyone afterwards so you'll be able to quickly grab them. Um, we do um, sometimes if um, do the presentation. I'm not sure, do you have these slides somewhere or do you want to just we can do whatever I, with the slides. <laughs> um, the, the Chris Library has a digital comments site, UNO, a digital comments okay. at UNO. Mm -hmm. So I'll be putting the slides and the text of my talk in there, mm -hmm. as well as a link to the video. <gasps> cool, perfect. All right. Um, then if you can send me that link, I can link back to it so we have them all connected Great. in there um, all together. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So librarians, we're all about saving and linking and archiving. <laughs> But I think about, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like any urgent questions, so come in, just some thanks, great project, glad we got to hear about it, comments coming in. Mm -hmm. So that um, is great. All right, then, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Amy, for being here with this morning, with us this morning. Um, I wasn't able to make it up to your, what you, when you had your opening, but I'm hoping at some point, we, I go visiting up to Omaha, um, regularly. I um, hope to come in sometime and take a look at it in person. <laughs> well, and certainly yeah. you'll be here for the um, NLA meeting, the Nebraska Library. <gasps> it's, I will, in yes, October. in October, yeah. yeah. We'll have a reception here at the library, so stop in then. Oh, great. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be a perfect time. Yeah, because I, I will be up there for those three days of the conference, yep. Um, and October I'm, is LGBTQ History Month, so oh, it's awesome. a nice timing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. I'm going to pull back the screen control to my page here. There we go. This is just our delicious, as I was working on most recently, <laughs> um, page. Um, but this is uh, the Library or Encompass Live's website. Um, if you need to look for us online, if you actually just Google Encompass Live, um, we are the only thing out there called that so far. So lucky us. <laughs> You'll come up with our website. Uh, this is where the archives will be here, right underneath our upcoming sessions, as all of our archived ones, as all of our previous ones, going back to the first one we did, which was in January 2009. Um, all of our recordings 
are on YouTube. Um, links are here. This is from last week's show. And then um, presentations, uh, they'll be in various places. We try to link to them wherever they might be. We have a SlideShare account. Some people put them on their own websites in Prezi, as Amy said, linking out to their page. Um, but we try, if we can, to link to wherever something um, would be available. And any other handouts or documents that people may include in, in, our, in their sessions. So that should be up there. Um, if everything processes and works um, and and plays nice with me today um, by this afternoon. I should have it up and I can let you guys all know that it's available. Um, uh, so that will wrap it up for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is the Cruitz Bennett Donor Advised Fund. This is a program for giving grants to specifically to small town libraries, public libraries in Nebraska. Um, Richard Miller will be here, our, our um, lobby development director, and um, Reggie Carlson, who is with the Nebraska Community Foundation, who um, works um, with this uh, grant fund, um, along with some um, um, libraries who have received the fund, um, the grant itself, and I believe one of the relatives of Shirley Cruitts Bennett is coming to join us as well. They are still involved with the um, grant program. So if you're looking for something to help out your small town um, public library here in Nebraska, check that out. And any of our upcoming shows we have here, we've got August all fully booked and, and on the schedule, and I'm always working on new shows. So um, September, October, and upcoming dates will be added um, as we get things finalized. So keep an eye on our page for that. Also, we are on Facebook. So if you are a big Facebook user, there we go. Um, like our Encompass Live page, I post um, updates. Like here, I posted this morning, log in right now for this week's Encompass Live. People come in on the fly. When our recordings are available, I won't put the notice on here. So if there's, um, if you're big on Facebook, do give us a like over there, and um, you can keep up with what we are doing here at um, on Encompass Live. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amy. And um, we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.